as her role as a CEO when she ran her very first board meeting. Literally, and I can't use this term enough, like a fish in water, she commanded the room, she commanded everything and everyone. And I was like, wow, Dion, you know. Right after that, I had to excuse myself really to just go to a corner in office to just let it all out because not only was I envious, I was a part of me was jealous. Like, why could I not have been able to do it? As a co-founder, am I not supposed to be good at this or better at this? In 2005, three Singaporean teenagers set up a second-hand clothes blog. They didn't realize it at the time, but it laid the framework for this multi-million dollar empire, one of the largest omni-channel women's wear brands in Southeast Asia that has gone global, delivering to 18 countries with its most recent pop-up store in Soho, New York. This week, we dive into the story of Love Bonito in the business of serving the modern Asian woman, which last raised a 50 million Series C in 2021, led by Primavera Capital Group, China's second largest private equity firm, which previously invested in Alibaba and ByteDance. We chat with Love Bonito's co-founder Rachel Lim about risking her mother's entire savings to overcoming jealousy of her new CEO and finding herself as a leader, even as they scale profits, revenues and markets and built to an exit for the investors. This is a conversation you don't want to miss. We are here in beautiful, sunny Singapore. Yes, welcome of, to Singapore. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. And we actually go way back. We do. Years ago when I was starting Lean in Malaysia. Yes. Um, and looking for empowering women in Singapore. Yes. And you came up, of course. Yes. And I'm glad we're making this happen. I know. Finally. Yes. In the flesh. Finally. But as you said, there's seasons for everything. And I believe this is just the right time. As you're about to pop, uh, so I'm getting <laughs> two you. weeks away. Exactly. So, yeah, prime time. So excited. Prime time with Reach. <laughs> so Reach, let's get started here in true Bill and Dollar Moose fashion. Or what does our audience need to know about you to context frame who you are? What brought you to the work that you're doing today? Yeah, so thank you again, Sarah, for having me. I'm um, truly an honor to be able to speak to you and your audience. So I'm Rachel. I'm the co-founder of Love Bonito. But beyond that, I grew up in a family that um, uh, low middle class income. I'm just an average student in school. And that's why I believe so much in two main things, you know, constantly being curious, constantly having the hunger to learn, to grow. Mm -hmm. And secondly, also ensuring that I surround myself with people smarter than me in different areas so that I can learn from them, you know, and together we can make magic. I think this two main philosophies have really guided me a lot in life yeah. and at work mm -hmm. that have also shaped who I am. And I truly believe that we have control over our destiny and how we turn out, uh, our grades in school or, you know, the family that we grew up in definitely affects us, uh, but it doesn't determine how we turn out eventually. So from a low middle income, mm -hmm. uh, you were in school and with a couple of your friends, yes. Velda and Viola decided you guys need some extra cash and decided yes. to sell some pre-loved clothes that you owned. Uh, this was in the era of block shops. This was 18 years ago, 18 babe. Years oh my God, ago. I feel so old. Almost two decades. Almost two decades. And those were the days where social media didn't exist yet. You know, it was really the block shop days where mm -hmm. we were selling our pre-loved clothes on the live journal platform, which was really like the eBay of... Asia. We wanted just some extra pocket money to, you know, go to the movies, go shopping. So that was how we started. Mm -hmm. uh, Viola and Velda and I came together and we decided, okay, since this is something that's new and exciting, why don't we just try it out? So after a while of doing that, we realized that, wow, people kept coming back for more. They were excited with maybe the novelty of being able to shop online. And also we realized that they they kind of resonated with our taste and our preferences. Mm. So when we ran out of secondhand clothes to sell, we decided to go overseas like Thailand to import clothes to sell. Right. And after a while of doing that, I realized that, hey, there's always something missing from the pieces that we brought in. Be it the quality, the fit, the mm. design. There was always something I wanted to change. And back then, you also realized that a lot of... Um, 
international brands, global brands coming into Asia were primarily created for the Western women in mind. Yep. Like your Zara, H&M, Mango, Forever 21 back then. So finally, in my final year of university with no fashion, no design, no business background, I uh, decided to drop out of school to mm -hmm. co-start Love Bonito. So this was in 2010. Yeah. So from Bonito Chico yeah. to Love Bonito, yeah. what was the traction that you were seeing that convinced you and yeah. in fact uh, convinced your mother yeah. to give her <laughs> entire life savings to you to yeah. really push forward with this idea? I think back then, you know... Um, it was also a really tumultuous time for my family. Mm. My dad was going through bankruptcy because of the Asian financial crisis. My mom was already working two jobs to support the family. And there I was, you know, in my final year of university, I was bonded to the government. So if I wanted to drop out of school, I had to pay off a five-figure sum bond to the government. Yeah. And I was really nervous when making the decision. But in my heart of hearts, I knew that I needed to strike when the iron is hot. Mm -hmm. I've always believed in this concept that before we fire the cannonball, we fire bullets. And I've been already testing on the site um, through the, a couple of years of selling pre loved clothes, or selling imported clothes, and also then trying manufacturing and designing our own pieces. That was when I realised that, hey, there is traction and there is momentum. And I knew that if I were to put in extra attention, time, energy, resources into the business, there is huge potential that it could go somewhere. Because in school, I was worrying about, okay, the emails I needed to attend to, the orders I need to send out. And after school, you know, while, while working, I was worried about the assignments, the examinations yeah. I had to study for. So I was in two minds and I was split and I wasn't excelling in either Mm -hmm. you know, school or work. So I decided, okay, I need to take a bet. And that was when I decided to go to my mom to ask, you know, like, hey, mom, I know, like, you know, it's a tough time for all of us and could you just, you know, lend me a five-figure sum, which actually amounted to her entire life savings, I realised after, mm -hmm. um, so that I can drop out of school to start the business, to co-start the business proper. And yeah, I mean... It took her a while to really accept it because to her back then, online shopping was unheard of, right? She was like, oh, actually, is what you're doing even legal? Will the authorities come after you? Why are people, you know, wiring you money before they even see or receive their goods physically? I owe it to her to, uh, that, that she took that leap of faith with me to do this. And yeah, ever since it's yeah. been history. So I'm just curious just to, to dive deeper on this. I mean, coming from a low middle income family in Singapore, yeah. right? I mean, and you know, I was born in Malaysia, yeah. so we understand the Asian cultural context 100%. in that education is or a, cert, a, safe, a paper. A paper is a safe route. And obviously she wanted a better future for you. Yeah. How did you convince her that this was going to be? Yeah. It? So that's why I've always thought, oh, I must be a really good salesperson. <laughs> <laughs> I won my first deal. But no, in, right. in all seriousness, it was really tough for her to get, oh, to get past it. Her friends, my relatives were like, oh, you obviously you shouldn't, you shouldn't do that. You know, like, it's so silly. At least graduate first, so if anything, you can fall back on it. But I remember telling her, you know, mom, I would forever regret if I don't give this a shot. And I know I really have a good chance at it. And I think it really helps for her to also see how hard I've been working on this. And Absolutely. on the side, she also saw how business was getting busier in that sense. We had, we've had more orders and things like that. So while she didn't fully understand exactly what's going on and what it entails, mm -hmm. I guess that's what faith is. Right, it's kind of like just you know trusting um, the person, trusting their process, and just hope for the best. Um, and I've always asked her, right? Like actually looking back, mom, why did you decide to do it? I know it must have been very hard. Uh, she said that you know, as a parent, you always want to give your child that one shot in life. Wow. And I'm forever grateful to her, you know, that she gave that to me. Oh, do you remember how much traction, sort of the volume of sales that you were making at that point? We were going to the post office like multiple trips a day with hundreds and hundreds of packages, you know, shipping it out locally. So I think that was also something that 
yeah, I realised that, hey, there's something that we can capitalise here or at least worth giving it a good shot. Yeah, love yeah. it. When it comes to running a bang or a business, nothing matters more than generating revenue. But sales folks aren't just closing deals, they're tracking down leads, forecasting growth, whipping up reports, managing contacts, creating content, crunching numbers, the list goes on and on. With Q4 around the corner, there's a better way to win. And it all starts with the new HubSpot Sales Hub. With HubSpot Sales Hub, your data, tools, and teams are fully linked inside a smart and highly customizable platform that feels good to use. Turn prospects into pipeline and close the deal all in one place. Plus, sequences and smooth workflows help reps streamline tasks and spend more time on what they do best, connecting with customers. With Sales Hub, closing deals is no big deal. Try it for yourself at hubspot.com sales. So you, Velda, and Viola, who are both sisters as yes, well, uh, yes. which is an interesting dynamic because yeah. in some way, uh, family business is first of all difficult, but being the third person, the third stool yeah. to this relationship of yeah. three co-founders, yeah. how was that journey in Love Bonito? Unlike starting businesses today, Firstly, when we first started, entrepreneurship wasn't even a word like it is today. When we first started, it was really like a passion project, a hobby. We wanted to come together to do something that we were excited about, which was really fashion. Yeah. And so when we decided, okay, you know what, we're going to give this a shot together, uh, we just decided to jump in and do this together. If I were to start the business now with co-founders, I would definitely also... Um, ensure that we are very clear on what our roles and responsibilities, where our strengths and weaknesses lie, where we each come in, are we aligned in the vision or where we want to take this together. It was an amazing you know, time starting it together with two of my closest friends. We grew up together in church. We knew each other so well. We had so much fun doing it together. But I think really the journey of Love Bonito from Bonito Chico to Love Bonito and how it started is so different from businesses today where you start out, you are expected to already have like a 10-page business plan, you know, and business model, everything mapped out. So when we first started, it was really organic, uh, more like we wanted to try something fun, which then took off on its own and got to where it is today. Yeah. yeah. So are you all still as involved as you were? How has that relationship, if you can speak to that? I mean, yeah. I'm always curious to the co-founder dynamic and yeah. I know one has decided to move on as well. Yes. So Viola is still a shareholder. She's on our board as well. 18 years, it was really in the most transformational time of our lives where we were in our, you know, early 20s or even late teens, you know, like 18, yeah. 19, and then 18 years, you know, to today I'm 36. So this was really the time where we were also finding our footing, finding our identity, finding what is it that we're really passionate about and want to do in life. So this was really a huge transitional time for us where, you know, we realized along the way, maybe one of us wanted to pursue something else. Um, Velda wanted to take a pause to also pursue her studies in, in other areas as well, to deepen her knowledge in those areas. So I think it's really also understanding and respecting each other's journeys in mm -hmm. life. When Velda left, we were so close. We were so used to doing business together, doing this together. Initially, I was like really sad and I and I couldn't understand why she left. Looking back now, I'm so grateful, you know, um, at how everything panned out and how we have all grown in our individual ways because I think we were forced to also grow up and discover who we are and what we're meant to do in life, mm -hmm. you know, through each of our individual journeys. And Le Bonito will, and Bonito Chico will always be an important part of our lives. This is not uncommon, right? Where you have co-founders that come together and then one decides, uh, this yeah. chapter is yeah. done for me. Yeah. I need to move on. Yeah. What do you think folks with co-founders need to know about bringing out the best in that dynamic of working together with uh you know, partner. Yeah, even today, right, when I work very closely with different partners in the business, I think what's really important is that open and honest conversation. Mm -hmm. And it's not just something that happens twice a year or once a year during reviews. I think it's something that needs to happen much more often than we know. 
having that open and honest conversation, really expressing our truest uh, feelings, talking through difficult emotions, talking through, you know, difficult times together. I think that is something that is so important. Uh, and I think that's something that I've also learned. I am a recovering people pleaser, so it's very hard for me to have tough conversations. But I've learned that that is so important if I really want a partnership that is really tight, that will really you know, go through the highest highs and the lowest low key. Are there questions that you felt, man, I should have asked that earlier I'm of sure. my co-founder? I'm sure. I think looking back likewise, right? I think yeah. both ways we have learned and grown so much from this episode and like it opened our eyes to so much. Because when we first started, it's really a time where this was something so new for all of us. Mm -hmm. No one has navigated this online sphere the way that we have at least in Singapore so we were the pioneers in the scene there was so much that we had to learn discover and pay for ourselves much less you know on the business side and then also on the individual personal side what is it like being a partner an equal partner in the business what does this mean what does it demand of me if you were advising a younger reach right uh in managing these co-founder relationships what what sort of questions would you say okay every week you need to check in to make sure there's a pulse check ask yeah. this question what would that I be like i think it's very much like a relationship a marriage a partnership and today even dion and myself who is my ceo i think it's important to come together weekly or at least bi-weekly to talk through what's on your mind. How can I help you? Do you have any feedback for me? What is it that's bothering you? Things like that to really, these high-level questions that in the end you realise that wow, there's so much that we can open up to and yeah. just spill, right? Yeah. And to hear each other out. I think at the end of the day, that is so important to give each other that space to be seen and to be heard. Yeah. So, Love Bonito. First of all, tell us a little bit about the name from Bonito Chico to Love Bonito. Yeah. And the I've heard you talk about this business and your vision yeah. to be the business, not of fashion, yeah. but the business of empowering women. Yeah. Tell us a little bit more about the history of the name and yeah. how it shaped sort of the vision for this business. So when Viola Velda and I first started Bonito Chico, you know, obviously we didn't think too much of it. It was just something fun. Hence, it's Spanish for pretty boy. Bonito oh. Chica means pretty girl, but we thought, okay, Bonito Chico rhymed better. So, obviously, we Love didn't it. think too much about that. And finally, when we wanted to come out in 2010 to design and manufacture our own pieces and collections, we wanted to go on a dot-com platform to move on from a live journal to a dot-com platform. And someone had already cyber-squatted um, bonitochico.com. Oh, no. <laughs> and demanded 20,000 US dollars from us. And obviously, we didn't have that sum of money. So, we decided, okay, we're not going to give in to that and also decided okay anyways it might be a good time for us to rebrand and so we called ourselves love comma bonito which is love comma pretty or beautiful yeah. in spanish the comma is really important to us because it's like a sign off from us in everything that we do the products that we create the experiences that we create it's like a sign off from us to you something that started at us wanting to share our love for fashion over the years the thoughtfulness in which we create our products right how we're so anal about each and every detail. Why is the waistline not one inch higher or not one inch lower? Why is it exactly the way it is? Firstly, we truly believe that clothing is like an outfit, an armour of superpower. When you look good, you feel good about yourself. You stand a little taller, you speak a little louder and you shine a little brighter. So that's what we really believe that we are meant to do through Love Bonito. Fashion is just a vehicle for us and an important vehicle for us to reach out to women. But ultimately, at the end of the day, what we're really interested in is really helping women discover who she is through her style, through expressing herself, to embrace all of herself, whether is it physically, whatever um, insecurities we might have our, of ourselves, and then to finally step into the largest versions of ourselves, the, yeah. the highest potential of ourselves. And that is why, for us, we believe so much in, you know, putting in so much love and thought through our creations, through our experiences, and also beyond that, the content that we come up with. Mm -hmm. You know, it's really in helping to journey with women to come into her own. 
So who was your ideal customer then? And is that the same customer profile today? Yeah. So, you know, along the way in the journey, we've always had customers tell us, oh, Rach, or, you know, hey, team, thank you so much for, you know, giving me that confidence I needed for my first interview, my first presentation, my first major client meeting, my first date, you know, blah, 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 things like that. So, really, we're here, I think, primarily for Asian working women. And I think that's something that's very important for us. And we're very focused on that. Yeah. And what is the Asian? I mean, I, I know you've talked about this, you know, the modern Asian woman yeah. who has, of course, uh, from a practical standpoint, yeah. her, you know, dimensions are yeah. different. I know for you, you had problem with pants. Yes, uh, I Which I also have pants. because I'm slightly uh, vertically challenged, <laughs> let's put it that way. Most of us are in that's Asia. That's right. That's so I've right. always thought that, you know, I could never wear pants because oh, my legs are too short, my hips are too big until we created our own. And I realized that while it resonated with thousands of other women, so the, the, mo the modern Asian woman for us is someone who is multifaceted. Mm -hmm. She wears many hats, right? I'm not just a daughter, a partner, a good friend. I'm pursuing my career. That's why through the collections and the pieces that we create, we really want to be able to be there for a woman in the different milestones of her life. For her at work, when she's nailing an, a, a presentation, or even, you know, when she's a bridesmaid for her best friend, or even when she's, she's going through, you know, like her first child, maternity... Uh, childbirth and things like that, we're always there. So I think for us, you know, when we talk about the modern Asian woman, it's also someone who really wants to own all of who she is, own her voice, be proud of, you know, her heritage, where she's from. So I think, you know, that's one aspect. And then, of course, the other aspect is like the physical aspect where mm -hmm. Asian women, we generally have different pop proportions of a body compared to a Western woman, right? Yeah. And I think that's what we also cater to uh, and address. So in terms of market positioning, we've had our mutual friend Vivi Yusuf yes. on as well, yes. who's been through quite a journey yes. uh, with Fashion Valley, the clothes of that and she of course had uh, really transitioned into targeting the yeah. modest modern the modest modern woman yeah right and yeah. for you was that were you looking to be the next Zara H&M yeah I think for us we also you know we want to stay true to who we are and that's why one of the reasons why I think Le Bonito has you know remained on top of our game is because we are a bunch of real women creating for other real women. So what in that sense, what I mean is that we understand the needs, the concerns uh, that other women, especially Asian women, want and need. Uh, you know, down to what they're looking for in a brand, what they're looking for in products when they shop, how they want to feel. You, know, you don't know how many times people have told us like, oh my God, this fits like a dream. I don't need to alter it. I don't need to send it to the tailors. I don't need to spend extra money. I don't have to feel like this was created for someone else and I just happened to wear it and I just need to mm. alter it to fit me. So I think all of these things have been very encouraging for us. Yeah, but of course, you know, brands are increasingly like the Zara's of the world, are increasingly trying to cater, yeah. right, for the Asian woman. They know yeah. it's a growing class that is earning high income, yeah, right? So it we're is. smart, we're educated, we it want is. more in life. Yeah. So it is definitely a great market to be acquired. How are you thinking about Love Bonito as a brand as now you're expanding globally, right, yeah. to America and beyond. One of the reasons why we are expanding to America is also because a couple of years ago during COVID, we realized that, hey, there is an uptick in um online orders from America and that got us very curious because we were not really spending so much on ads or marketing dollars there then. When we dug deeper, we realised that, hey, first and foremost, there is this trend of like Asian pride and Asians wanting to support mm. other Asian brands, especially in America. A lot of them that we spoke to said that, oh, my friends introduced me to your brand because it's created especially for a woman like myself. And they felt seen, they felt heard. The product is one important aspect. The other thing is like representation and messaging. For us, if you realize our representation, like our models, we are very specific in yes. the type of faces that we use to, so that when our target audience, when she comes in online or in store, she realizes that, wow, this model looks like me and I can relate to her. And I think that's also something that is very intentional on our part and it's very important for us when we want to reach out to women like that. America seems to be an interesting market for us and so we decided to just spend more time getting to know the market better 
and finally also opening our first pop-up store in New York um, earlier this year. Yeah, congratulations yeah. on Thank that. Thank you. And of course, you've got some fuel to your fire with a CEC that was closed a couple of years yes, ago yes. Uh, by investors that invested into folks yeah. like ByteDun, so yes. some serious heavy Alibaba, hitters yeah. in Alibaba mm -hmm. uh, to bring you to the next stage. You know, what, what is the vision here? How are you going to compete in a world where, I mean, fashion, let's let's be frank, like yeah. it's, it's competitive. It is competitive. And I think for us is how can we outdo ourselves more importantly, right? Can, how can we continue to do better to serve our customers and our community so much better? I think there really is a gap, especially for Asian women, for a brand that truly stands for them, that truly represents them and resonates with them. And I think especially in a world today where we are seeing the rise of Asian voices or the rise of people like Michelle Yeoh and all that finally being recognised. And I think as Asians ourselves, we feel like like, wow, we have a place in this world and we want to be able to own that place in this world. Love for Nito plays a very important part in coming alongside a woman to journey with her in her individual, individual journey of becoming the best version of herself. And what is your vision here in terms of uh, where this brand would be seen? Is the positioning the same, you think, in Asia as yeah. it is in the markets abroad, how are yeah. you thinking about the strategy here? So one thing we realize is that it's primarily women, you know, like 29 mm -hmm. to 40, right? It's also the woman who is like, you know, building her career uh, in the thick of really, you know, finding herself, owning herself and carving out for herself what success looks like for her. Mm -hmm. So that is really the woman that we're targeting. Yeah, and of course, as part of this growth, uh, actually, was it 2017 that you had your first physical store? Yes, in Singapore. In Singapore. Yeah. And that was also about the time that Dion Song yes. uh, came in. Oh. Also met. Yes. And she is a powerhouse. She Absolutely is. love her. Yes. Uh, tell us a little bit about, you know, how you chose to bring someone else in to yeah. step into the light as yeah. CEO of a brand that you started. Uh, so Dion is Love Bonito's first ever CEO. Well, I think in 2016, I remember having a very honest conversation with myself and also then I brought the conversation to my first and only investor then, Hien, from Open Space yes. Ventures. And I told him, you know, Hien, today Love Bonito is, you know, at this stage and actually our true potential is like way up higher. And for us to get to, you know, from where we are to where we can be and need to be in our lifetime, I will need someone who can come in, you know, as CEO to run this together with me. And for me, I also recognize that as a founder, I don't always have to be the number one person in a sense where, you know, I think my role as a founder can and should evolve through every stage of the business. And I think for me, it's also having that humility to be able to see that, understand that, and also recognize in which areas of the business in this stage or the next stages can I continue to really value at and what my superpower is, you know, and then being responsible for that. And then surrounding myself with people smarter than me in different disciplines to be able to run other aspects of the business. So I think that for me is, you know, something that I came to th terms pretty early, I would say. Uh, even though I think especially in this world of startups, a lot of people were like, oh, but you're a founder, are you sure you don't want to be the CEO? Why are you not the CEO? Mm -hmm. You know, are you not good enough? Or whoa, whoa, and things like that. And for me, it's just a very objective decision that, I just want to do what's best for the company. Yeah. And at this stage, it is, you know, perhaps bringing someone alongside. And, I, I, and, and for me, 2016, I just wanted to explore what it's like, you know, what's the pool and the talent out there. Is there someone that exists that I can bring on board to incentivize, you know, and to also motivate uh, to run this together with me. Yeah. So that was when the journey began where, you know, I started to look for and speak to many different candidates or suitable candidates uh, to look for someone who could do this with me. And I spoke to, I think, like 30, 40, 40 different candidates and wow. I realised that, wow, okay, you know, you may be great on paper, but I think what I'm looking for is a certain spark that, you know, you truly believe in the vision and the mission of the company. And I think what's important in hiring the right person for the business is also in ensuring that, you know, there is um, the exchange that we can give each other. What can you get out of Love Bonito and me 
in this season of your life that you choose to journey with us. And for Love Bonito, you know, how can I use your gifts, talents and abilities to bring us to the next level while also developing you? After many months of searching, I finally also then met Dion in a women's networking dinner. Mm -hmm. And when I first spoke to her, you know, it wasn't like, oh my goodness, she's the right person for mm -hmm. the role. But it was more like, oh wow, I'm very intrigued by her mind, the way she thinks about things, the questions that she asks. Um, back then, she was in a huge leadership position in Sephora as well. Um, and she had just moved from um, being managing director at Zalora. So I was also very intrigued to you know, hear from her, learn from her. And so I asked her out on a few dinner, drinks, date a couple of times. And we realized that, hey, firstly, we hit it off. I think mm -hmm. that's very important, yeah. that we need to like each other as people. Secondly, I think we're very aligned in like values, principles, the way we see people, the way we see businesses, you know, mm -hmm. how they can be enduring. And thirdly, I realized that Oh, we have very complementary strengths. So I think for me, that was when I, you know, decided to reach out to her and ask her, hey, would you like to join me on this journey? We had like at least eight months of like getting to know each other as friends, as people yeah. first before I offered her. And that was also as much as me interviewing her, as much as her interviewing me, right? right. So I think, I mean, Dion, clearly she has no lack of opportunities. Um, so I think that was um, how it really began. And I decided to yeah. offer her a role with us, first as Chief Commercial Officer. Right. And then, you know, she obviously exceeded expectations, became COO. And finally, you know, in 2021, became our first ever CEO. Mm -hmm. And... I think that has been one of the best decisions I've ever made for the company. Yeah. So when you say complementary skill sets, yeah. what what are they? Yeah. So Dion is someone who is, you know, she thrives and she comes alive when, you know, bringing a business from startup to scale up. Yep. There are different breeds of people needed for different stages of a company. You know, there is a zero to one, there is a one to ten, and there is a ten to hundred stage of a business mm -hmm. and Dion is just like a fish in water when you know I, I look at her the way she you know runs the organization leads the organization from a growth stage to a scale up stage I don't have that uh, capacity or ability to be able to do it the way that she does for me I am very very excited or oh, I come alive when you talk about products community building you know and things like that so yeah. I think that's also where I recognize that wow she can definitely you know run the show in that yeah. sense Love yeah it. and talking about running the show one of the very beautiful things that uh, you talked about was really in in um, oh, reflecting about yes. Dion, right? Yes. In that there was a situation... One of my life lessons. Yes, one of your most <laughs> important life lessons yes. in, in one situation where Dion ran the board meeting, ran yes. the show... Yes. And you were almost, in, you were in tears, actually. In tears. You were in tears because, man, she was so good. You were envious. Sarah, I was, that was, <laughs> I was jealous, you know. And, and, and to maybe to add some context to your, what you're talking about, Dion, as her role as a CEO, when she ran her very first board meeting, literally, and I can't use this term enough, like a fish in water, she commanded the room, she commanded everything and everyone. And I was like, wow, Dion, you know. Right after that, I had to excuse myself really to just go to a corner in office to just let it all out because not only was I envious, I was a part of me was jealous. Like, why could I not have been able to do it? As a co-founder, am I not supposed to be good at this or better at this or the best at this? I think, and I think in that moment, I had to reframe and and just you know talk to myself like you know, Rach. At the end of the day, this is why you have Dion. Mm -hmm. And at the end of the day, you know, this is you in your journey of learning to admire someone's gifts without questioning your own. Absolutely. And I think that for me is one of the biggest lessons. And till today, whenever I see her, you know, doing what she does best, I'm like, wow, Dion. And I always make it a point to like give her that genuine compliment and encouragement. Like, wow, Dion, you truly are living your calling. Like, Dion, this is really your stage, you know, and things like that. And for me, it's like a reminder that this is why I truly believe we all have different gifts, abilities, and talents in life. And this is why we are meant to discover what that is for ourselves and partner up with people who are differently able and differently skilled from us to create magic together. So 
um, I, I, someone asked me once, oh, do you have imposter syndrome? I said, oh my God, are you kidding? Every day, because I'm surrounded by people like Have that. you seen Dion? <laughs> <laughs> have you seen Dion? Have you seen the rest of my yeah. team? Like, I put myself in a position where every day I'm, you know, like reminded that, wow, these people, I'm so proud of them. They're like so excellent in what they do and like really living their zone of genius or living their calling. It reminds me and encourages me even more like, hey, you know, focus on your journey. Find yours. Find out Absolutely. what yours is. And it's easier said than done, especially when, you know, it's a co-founder-CEO dynamic. But I'm so glad that I've been able to work through it, confront it and be honest with it, you know. Mm-hmm. And yeah, I get yeah. to a point where I'm, I'm genuinely so proud and will continue to lift her up in, yeah. uh, in, in, in what she's doing. Well, you're both on the same team, right? That's at yes. the end of the day, you know, to bring yeah. your vision as well yeah. that you started to the next level. And what a treat to have someone who believes in the same what way. What a treat. Indeed. What a treat. Yeah. I also tuned into um, some of Dion's interviews yeah. and she talks, of course, given her experience in Zalora and Sephora yep. about the omni-channel approach yes. and the investments that you all are making yeah. moving forward as you scale, as you think globally, but also uh, in an omni-channel approach. Can you yeah. talk to us a little bit about this phase for yeah. Love Bonito? I think for us, we've always believed, you know, that we're not just an online, uh, you know, business or an offline business. We're just wherever our customers are at. And the truth of the matter is that they are both online and offline, right? They surf on their phones. They also walk the, they also walk the streets. They go to malls. So I think that's something that's very important for us to recognize. Even though we started digitally native, you know, mm-hmm. um, especially when we started having pop-up stores from 2015, 2016 to, again, you know, fire bullets before we fire cannonballs, which is, you know, committing to a permanent store in 2017. We also realized that, hey, you know, there is that tangible experience that customers are looking for today. Uh, And I think very much so for us as a brand that really wants to build uh, community having that physical presence is very important for us especially because you know it's that safe space for them to gather to come together to get to know us and our team better as people as well and what we truly stand for I think that's something that's been very important for us so that's why in every new market that we go to we try to go with a two-prong approach like of course there's going to be digital marketing right. there's going to be ads you know there's going to be influencer marketing but then and as much as we can, once there is a certain level of momentum, we also want to ensure that we have a physical presence through pop-up stores mm-hmm. um, to be able to allow customers, you know, to get to know us better, to try our products for themselves yep. and to experience the brand physically. So that's been one of the strategies that we've had since, you know, our home base in Singapore. Uh, we've also done it in Malaysia, Indonesia, Hong Kong, and most recently, US. Yeah, and tell us a little bit more about Moom Health. Yeah. Which is about supplements for yes. women. I mean, this is very different from the apparel yeah. that yeah. you and I are, of course, wearing yes. today. How do you know this is the right step to go, I guess, in a different vertical in some way? Yes, women is yeah. the end consumer. Yeah. But why this direction? Why not something else? Our long-term vision is that we're not just in the business of fashion, but ultimately in the business of women. Mm-hmm. And I think for us, you know, the Asian heritage and the Asian nuance is so important to us. How can we build an ecosystem where, you know, we have already over the last almost two decades built a strong influence in the sense where people trust us as a brand. They know our values. They trust that, you know, what we produce, what we bring to the table is something that... uh, That is trustworthy, basically. So for us, you know, how can we build an ecosystem where we also bring in other like-hearted brands? It's like Moom Health, you know, for them, they focus on Asian ingredients as well to Mm -hmm. create supplement products that really address real women problems that you and I face, menstrual cramps, bloating, and things like that. So I think for us, you know, how can we at the same time also support women founders and young women founders in this ecosystem to elevate them and bring them up together with us in this journey. So that was how Moom Health began. How we also started to then, you know, get to know Moom Health and their founders better and then subsequently, you know, have a share in investing in their company to support them 
in, in their growth. So is the vision almost like a one-stop shop? Love Benito is a one-stop shop for the Asian modern woman, whatever your needs are? Yeah, hopefully. And I think that's the long-term vision. Right. In the next couple of years, we're still also ensuring that we fine-tune a lot of our fashion vehicle and there's so much exciting uh, developments there. But I think, yes, we're always on the lookout yeah. uh, for like-hearted brands or sister brands, as we call, uh, to be able to support them in this space. Yeah. Create Like the Greats, hosted by my friend Ross Simmons, is brought to you by the HubSpot Podcast Network, the audio destination for business professionals. Each episode hosts an in-depth analysis of some of the greatest creations and creators of all time, along with deep dive conversations of the creative process that went into building companies, brands, stories, and more. An episode I really loved was actually one of Ross's earliest episodes on Masterclass and the highly effective content marketing strategies that the company applied to attain a valuation of, you know, just over $2 billion. From SERPs to SEO, I learned a bunch and I think you will too. Listen to Create Like the Greats wherever you get your podcasts. So Rachel, 18 years, you've done the 0 to 1, you're now at the 1 to 10. You've yeah. brought on a, a great team to help you yes. on this journey. Yeah. How different is 0 to 1 to 1 to 10? What are your biggest challenges now? Absolutely different. And ultimately, if there's a common thread, it is really in getting the right people on board with you at the right stage of a business. I really believe what Jim Collins says, you know, um, at the end of the day, it's about ensuring that you have the right people in the right seat of the bus. People have different, whether is it motivations or uh, capacity because a startup is very different from a growth stage business as well. Like it, it demands a different side and different parts of us. It's constantly asking myself, do we have the right people in the right seat for this stage and the next stages? Because there are people that were great, you know, in the beginning who might not be great for us in the next stages. And it's really confronting that brutal fact. Mm -hmm. And also then having the important conversations with them that, hey, you know what, maybe your time is up. And I speak for myself as a co-founder as well. Hey, maybe my time is up in this certain aspects. I need to let go, bring in people of a different caliber to run this certain part of the show. Yeah. So I think for me, it has always been there. And I truly also believe, secondly, that everything rises and falls on leadership. Do I have the right leaders who are really, you know, motivating, supporting, leading the entire org, you know, yeah. in this stage of a business? Because it requires a very different mindset shift. Yeah. Um, going from 0 to 1, 1 to 10 is like shifting gears completely yeah and i think that for me is also realizing that hey if you want to hire great talents you need great leaders and important. talking about leadership i spoke with your first hire cindy oh, moy actually yes. who mentioned She's, that yeah you've transformed wow. as a leader right which is inspirational She's been with us for 10 years exactly That's crazy yeah. and she said the person that you were when you first started and the person that you are today is, of course, oh. totally different. Yeah, I hope so. Yes. Because I've been doing this, you know, for 18 years now. And she was really, she was there with us day two, you know. And yeah. all the way for 10 years, she's given a good 10 years of her life to really journey with us, to grow with us. She's been an incredible, important part of the journey. And yeah. I think... To be, able, to be able to hear that is so encouraging because like I shared in the very beginning, Sarah, at the end of the day, it doesn't matter where we come from, the family mm. background that we have or how well or not we did in school. At the end of the day, we can make a difference in our life if we choose to. And I chose to do that very intentionally through learning, reading, journaling, reflecting, doing a lot of inner work, you know, yeah. um, seeing coaches, seeing therapists to work on myself because I really believe that when I get better, the people around me get better and yeah. the entire organisation gets better. The, I think through the last two decades have had so many lessons, you yeah. know, beyond also the important one, learning to admire someone's gifts without questioning my own, but it's also learning how to put on my horse blinders and run my mm. own race. Especially with social media today, it's so easy to look to my left, to my right, to compare myself with other people. Um, but it's really in looking inwards at the gifts that I have. How can I hone it? How can I groom it and develop it so that I can shine in my own way and make a difference in my own way? And what leader do you want to be? Especially early on in the days, you know, as a young leader that was just starting out. Because I've never worked under anyone, so I don't yeah. know what's a good leader, what's a bad leader, uh, and things like that. So I've had to 
make mistakes and learn on my own. So early on, I was a very insecure and unsure leader where, okay, you know, I just wanted to emulate every other leader. For example, back when I first started, you know, the only entrepreneur leaders were like Steve Jobs, Mark Zuckerberg. And, you know, they would be glamorized by media and everyone. And I thought, oh my gosh, in order to be successful, I need to be like them. And I tried so hard to be like them. I read up so much about them. And I hated the person I was becoming, you know, because mm. it was just so unlike me. And along the way, through the early years of my journey, you know, whenever we did, as an organisation, whenever we did, like, strengths finders test or, you know, different personality tests to really discover more about ourselves and innately who we are, I would always score higher on maybe the people skills side of things and lower on everything else. Mm -hmm. And I will look at everyone around me and I'm like, oh, I wish I was like that. I, was, I wish I was like that. And it wasn't until one day, as cliche as it sounds, one of my employees, she came up to me and she said, hey, Rich, but what you have is not what we have. And, you know, it hit me so hard because as simple as that comment sounded, it really hit me so hard that, wow, okay, maybe there's some truth in that. You know, why don't I continue to learn more about giftings in these areas and yeah. find out more about them and find out how I can lean into this and lead with my strengths. Yeah. And that was when I decided to become very intentional in discovering myself accepting myself and embracing all of myself yeah. and recognizing that where I lack or where I'm weak at, you know, I can surround myself with people smarter than me and, and do this together to form a strong team. What is success to you? Would it be an IPO in the yeah. horizon? Is that something we're looking at? For the business, right? Okay, if we, if we determine success, I think at the end of the day, right, we do have shareholders, investors that we will need to account for some form of exit and an exit for them is, you know, IPO is one of the ways, um, but there are also a couple of other ways, right? But I think for me, it's also ensuring that they get their payoffs, you know, um, and exit in whatever form uh, that also they're happy and satisfied with. I think for me, success as a business is also Love Bonito being able to make a dent in the universe in our own unique way, you know, through what we're doing for Asian women in this space that we're so passionate about, primarily through fashion. Yeah. Yeah, and I think on an individual level, right, success to me is just really understanding at the end of, my, uh, at the, end of the day, you know, who I was created to be, what I was meant to do, and why I was even put on this earth for. To be able to hone all of that and understand my gifts and my abilities and to use that to serve the world and to serve the community, I think that to me is what success means. So you talked about exit and uh, you know huge awareness yeah. of your responsibility yeah. to your investors, right? Yeah. Uh, and that's actually something that we're all grappling with, right? Yeah. Founders and funders that tuning yes. in are feeling antsy with market conditions. It is. It is tough. Do you feel the pressure because yes. you've taken this check to yeah. head for an exit and is that the right thing for the business? Yeah, Sarah, that's a great question. Well, that's a question that I get a lot too, right? Especially a lot of young businesses, they ask like, oh, do you think I should do this? You know, do I, should I take VC money? Do you regret? I think at the end of the day, um, there's no point looking back. I really do do think that there is no right or wrong answer whether or not a business should take on VC money. It also, at the end of the day, depends on the drive and the goal of you that, that you have as a founder for your business. The reason why I took on you know, the investment with Open Space back then in 2016 was also because I knew that I needed that help. And money is just one of the one of the benefits that you get from having a VC or investor on board. I think what's important is also that strategic help that they can bring to the table to propel your business, you know, um, in a shorter amount of time um, than, than you could have done it by yourself. So I think that's also something that's very important. Mindful of the kind of investors that we bring on board because I think, yeah, I mean, as with, any kind of partnerships, like co-founders, uh, you know, relationships, marriages, I really do see that it can really make or break the dynamic. And it's very important that, you know, you are aligned with your partners, with where you want to bring the business to as well. So I think there are a lot of things at play. But I think for us in Le Ponito, honestly, at the end of the day, we have also benefited greatly from having these investors on board with us through the last 
seven years. So that's an interesting note to end on, yeah. um, you know, thinking about the future. I'm going now to my quick fire questions, yes. billion dollar questions to yes. reveal more about reach. And there's so much that we can go into. Yeah. But let's start with your guilty pleasure. Oh, chocolates for sure. Chocolate. And I don't share my my dessert. So Sarah, if I ever offer you, please don't take it. because I, <laughs> <laughs> I don't mean it. <laughs> I will take note. I will take note. A habit that you've picked up that has changed your life. Oh, journaling. Mm. You do it weekly, daily? Uh, I try to do it in very short form daily. Like just five minute gratitude journaling. Love it. Um, but like once a week at least on a Sunday, I will do long form journaling. Yeah. Most difficult decision you've had to make? Most difficult decision I've had to make? Wow. Wow, that's a tough one. Uh, wow. So many. First thing that comes to mind is usually the right thing. Whether or not I should marry my husband. Oh. Not, not because it's difficult, but most important, if I may rephrase it, because totally. I think that um, I came from a broken marriage once. Mm. So I know that my second marriage would be very important. And I've always known that, you know, who we choose to spend the rest of our lives with can make or break our lives. So that is, to me, you know, not one of the most difficult, but definitely one of the most important decisions I've had to make. Yeah. Love it. What would you tell your younger self, 18-year-old Rach? I would tell my younger self, you know, when things go well, don't get it to your, don't let it get to your head. When things don't go well, don't let it get to your heart. Mm. So you talked about Zuckerberg and Jobs as your ideal CEO back in the back day. Back then, yeah. Who is that ideal CEO today that you look up to? Well, ideal CEO, right? I think you mean like leader or yeah, because leader, I don't, whoever yeah. you it can yeah. be someone in the movies, it yeah. can be a character, yeah. Yeah. For me, I draw a lot of leadership inspiration and guidance and mentorship from John Maxwell. And mm. I think that I have learned tremendously from him and all of his books through two decades of, you know, finding my footing as a leader and being a leader. What's the most important sort of nugget from John Maxwell? Everything rises and falls on leadership is from John. And that is something that, you know, I, I have learned tremendously to take ownership that the buck stops with me and to be completely responsible for everything. Worst or best advice you've ever received? Worst, or, worst advice or best advice. So the worst advice is don't give up. I do think that mm. sometimes in life, we need to know when to give up. We need to know when to pivot. We need to know when to, have a, to activate plan B. And 10 years later, if we come back to the same room, what do you think we'll see? What will we be discussing? I think 10 years later, it would be, hopefully we'll discuss about, you know, a very successful exit for Love Bonito mm. and what that is, what that means, what that entails. And also for me, you know, then how I'm continuing to use my gifts and talents to be able to serve the community. Uh, what I'm really passionate about is bringing my community along with me on this growth and learning journey uh, to raise our consciousness in different topics in life and to basically just, you know, be on our own journey of becoming our own. Yeah. And of course, we can journey with you through your latest podcast that you yes. also released. So yes. Rage Reflects. Yes. Really excited for that. You want to pitch at this moment? You know, this is your time. Oh, thank you, Sarah, for having me. I'm mean, truly so grateful to be able to uh, share a little bit of my story. Rage Reflects is it's a hobby that, I'm st that I started that I'm doing on the side, you know, um, that have also really uh, made a pretty significant impact and I'm really excited to see where I can take this forward to. So yeah. we'll see where this goes. Love it. Well, Rage Keep making billion dollar moves and we're so excited Aww. to keep journeying with you. Thank you, Sarah. And thanks so much for tuning in this week. You can subscribe wherever you get your podcasts and follow our socials on Sarah Chang Global to get the latest on the show. It would really help me out too if you enjoyed this to rate and review our show on Apple Podcasts and share your favorite episodes with a friend. I'm Sarah Chang Spellings and you've been listening to Billion Dollar Moves.